Spanning the nation from California, Oklahoma, Iowa, Ohio, North Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. This is League One NCAA football. NCAA football. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a live edition of League One College Game Day. I am Coach Shalin Storm here hosting this live with my fellow coach, Coach Specter of Syracuse Orange, uh, coming to bring you guys tons of excitement to uh, do a season recap, and we have some bowl reveals coming later in the show. Uh, but first, my co-host, Coach Specter. rundown of this past season for each of the teams in League One, as well as a look at some of the ups and downs of their seasons. We'll take a look at their schedules and some of their best players. We'll also take a look at the Heisman race, some awards races, and of course, the big reveal, the bowl games. We've got some users who are anxiously awaiting to see which bowl games they might wind up in who they might be facing off against, and in some cases, whether or not they make a bowl at all. Not everyone gets the privilege. That's the honor that every coach hopes for, and we'll be anxiously awaiting that info further in the broadcast. But first, we'll get things started off right away here with the first team we'll take a look at, which is the Washington Huskies, uh, led by Coach Jay Barker. Um, they came into the season uh, having had a top 25 season the previous year uh, and having won the Pac-12 championship. Uh, but sadly, tragedy struck in uh, week three 
Uh, following the week three game, leading into their week four game uh, at UCLA, uh, you know, in, in one of the, uh, uh, Coach Jay Barker's legendary tough practices, uh, he took a, a side swipe of a hit, uh, kind of fell backwards, but a little funny, took a concussion on the uh, coaching tower, knocked his head against that metal coaching tower, and, um, you know, uh, he, was, he was hospitalized with a really bad concussion. And it turns out came up with a very rare uh, medical condition, uh, foreign accent syndrome. Uh, foreign accent syndrome uh, has affected less than 100 people since it was first discovered in 1907, or first established in the medical journals. And uh, sadly, sadly, Coach Jay Barker, um, Jerry Barker, to be specific, uh, you know, the, the the community's thoughts go out to go out towards him. Uh, you know, he he has had such a struggle coming back from his uh, French Canadian accent. Um, many of the players just not not able to understand him, and uh, you know he's he's been struggling. Seattle's best coffee company, uh, the the competition, of course, for uh, one of the other big coffee companies out there, got together, put in a huge drive. To uh, to uh, to help Coach Parker uh, learn English again, but uh, so that's been an uphill battle. Uh, we don't know what his uh, what his status will be moving forward, uh, but certainly, as with the rest of uh, the Washington Huskies community, our thoughts and prayers go out towards him. Uh, the, meanwhile, his team had to rally. They had to rally uh, around their assistant coaches. Uh, they uh, actually came through and won that week three game uh, on the road at UCLA, uh, which turned out to be a huge win. That was 21st ranked UCLA is uh, where they're where they're in their rankings right now. Then got blown out by Texas. Uh, of course, uh, took the big loss to Stanford on the road. The Cardinal being a very difficult matchup, uh, as well as uh, you know uh, Utah. Obviously, Coach Brack will get to the Utah Utes in a minute. That was a big, uh, big loss, a big win for Utah. Uh, the assistant coach is not quite able to pull it off. But the, probably the high point of the season uh, in the Barker Bowl, uh, you know, that was the one uh, from his uh, from his hospital bed in Montreal, uh, where uh, Coach Barker watched the game uh, and uh, his his players pulled through for him and were able to win. Uh, the Barker Bowl over Mississippi State uh, towards the end of the season. And, you know, they lost four out of five games, uh, but they still went five and seven, uh, four out of five to close there at the end. Just, you know, had too many injuries built up, um, or four out of six, rather, there at the end. Uh, able to get the rivalry win to close it out. Uh, had to have that one. But they're going to just miss a bowl game uh, with a five to seven record, even though uh, they are a very respectable seven in the Pac-12 standings. Uh, five and seven, just not quite enough to go bowling uh, for Washington, more than likely. It's possible, but uh, extremely unlikely. The uh, the low point, of course, obviously, uh, the one out there, uh, you know, the, the you could see it week in and week out, uh, all the, the players wearing the, the Florida Lee uh, sticker on their helmets in uh, solidarity with, with, Coach, with Coach Barker. Um, and, uh, once again, we, you know, our, our thoughts go out to him and, and we hope he makes a speedy recovery. Um, who do we have next coach? Yeah, just bouncing off that too. Of course, we, we wish all the best for coach Barker. We hope that, uh, he, you know, things turn around for him and he can be back here or back with his team and try to lead them back to glory, uh, like he did in his previous season. Uh, so all our thoughts and prayers are of course out to coach Barker. Uh, next, we're just going to go one team up here to Utah. Coach Bracken with the Utah Utes, his first year here at Utah after leaving. Uh, he just won the American Conference Championship with ECU the previous year and uh, thought he saw greener pastures at, in Utah, and he uh, got an offer this last offseason uh, before the beginning of the 16th season, and he went off to join the Utes. And a pretty good season for um, Coach. I got to ask a few of the coaches beforehand, um, 
you know, I asked them, how do you think your expectations for the season at the beginning panned out now at the, at the end? And Coach Bracken had to say, uh, these are uh, exact quotes, honestly, my expectations were exceeded. Being like the worst team in the conference overall-wise, I was just aiming for a bowl game. Washington being out of the game definitely made my path easier, but he's super pleased with the Rose Bowl appearance. Uh, that due to the fact that they did win the Pac-12 championship game, so they will be representing the Pac-12 in the Rose Bowl. This, you see, uh, they started off very, very hot, winning a lot of games. Um, obviously, the big win in the user game in the Texas Kickoff Classic started off hot. Uh, but I'm going to th- say the, you know, that was a really, really good 6-0 and start there. And there's the low point of the season. I think the biggest disappointing loss for them is that loss on the road to UCLA, uh, which almost proved costly because UCLA made a run to almost represent them in the Pac-12 championship um, had they not gotten that one extra win. But that could have proved to be a costly one, and it ended that six-game winning streak they had going there. Uh, so that one was probably very disappointing for the coach. And also that Arizona State game, uh, really, really disappointing there for them, losing that by four to a team that finished six and five. So disappointing there. The UCLA won just because it ended their winning streak in that Arizona State game. Just after the thrashing they got by number one Syracuse, just not able to lick their wounds the next week and kind of take a difficult loss there. And the yeah, big high point. Correctly, if I remember correctly, that, uh, that ASU game, uh, they both, both teams scored in the last minute of the play. That was back and forth up to the very end. Yeah, so it's it's always disappointing when you lose like that, and uh, you never want to get you know beat pretty bad, and you come out the next week and lose again. It always just hurts just a little bit more. Uh, but uh, still, they were able to bounce back and win the Pac-12 championship. And I the the game I think that sticks out the most that's a big time win for them. Uh, obviously, that user neutral site game was a big one, and I'm gonna go to that uh, week eight game on the road against now currently ranked number eight Oregon Ducks. They win that one by three. That was a big, big time game for the Utes, big time win for the new coach there in the Pac-12, showing that he's not going to be scared by these big teams that have already been established here. Uh, like he said, his expectations were one of the worst teams in the Pac-12 last year, and he immediately in one season turned them around to not only be competitive, but to win the Pac-12 championship game. So, uh, over the third-ranked Oregon State Beavers, who have only lost one game this year now, too, having lost that game. So, very great season for the Utes. Uh, yeah, especially, um, you know, in addition to all that, uh, they had to come back from uh, three different quarterbacks. They had to start three different quarterbacks throughout the course of the season. And, um, you know, I think uh, it speaks a lot to, to Coach Brad's ability that uh, Utah was able to get the wins that they got and keep themselves in position in that uh, that Pac-12 South and get her done and make the conference championship game. Of course, you know, pull off the upset down against Oregon State. Both of the wins against Oregon State and Oregon State, um, big ones there for the Utes. Uh, moving on uh, to the next team uh, in review, uh, if we take a look into the Mid-American Conference, uh, it was uh, a little bit of a down year this year for the Buffalo Bulls. Uh, the Bulls um, last season uh, made a bowl game and uh, at different points flirted with the top 25. Um, had an outstanding defense last year, but most of those starters graduated. And uh, coming into the season, uh, it was almost uh, like they were on probation. They'd lost so many starters. So uh, they knew going into the season it was going to be an extremely challenging year with uh, a drop-off of, you know, 10 or 12 points on the team overall. Uh, and then, you know, coming out, obviously, uh, you know, Louisville, uh, tough, uh, tough uh, power five team. Uh, the user game against Navy was difficult. Uh, huge win in uh, their third game and that rivalry game over Temple. Uh, that's the one that Buffalo fans would point to um, as uh, Temple becoming a, a little bit of a heated rivalry there. Those two teams facing off a couple of times now in a row in, uh, in some pretty firecracker games. Well, that would be uh, the only win they would pull out too, Coach. That's true. Uh, that's true. They had some close calls. Uh, they played uh, some bowl teams pretty tough. Uh, ball State's going to be going bowling at 8-4. and four, uh, And of course, you know, the 
Red Hawks of Miami ranked 16th, Navy ranked 22nd. Um, you know, not quite the easiest schedule there. Uh, obviously, Central Michigan, a very difficult uh, user team there further in the in the lineup. And then, of course, to close out the season, Bowling Green and Kent State, 8-3 and three and 9-3. and three. So, uh, you know, if you look at their combined opponent's record of 91 and 53, uh, you know, I put that up against, against any other user team. I think they may have played one of the more difficult schedules this year. And, uh, you know, on top of uh, or building year, that's that's a recipe for quite the struggle. Uh, oh, they they fought valiantly. Absolutely. They fought valiantly. They uh, they had the lead in a couple of games and lost it late. In particular, the Nolan Illinois game, uh, the low point of the year, with the two score lead, losing in overtime. Uh, but a lot of promise uh, for the future. They got a lot of young starters, which one of the reasons why they had a lot of difficulty this year. And uh, we're all excited to see uh, what uh, Coach does. With uh, Coach Soccer Pro does with uh, the Buffalo Bulls, uh, knowing that uh, you know he's clearly a proven winner last year, um, he's certainly capable of uh, moving this program forward. Uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what kind of contract he gets, and, and maybe uh, if Buffalo wants to spring for uh, maybe a new coordinator uh, to kind of lend a helping hand, might change the scope of things for next year's Bulls. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens in the offseason if they get get any new coordinators or anything like that happens. Uh, there's a lot of problems on the team. Kirk Cousins, the true freshman quarterback, had to come in and, you know, try to make an impact right away. And it's high school ball is a whole lot different than, than Division One football. So it's a lot to ask from the young young man. He, he tried his best. The one thing you can say is despite the 1-11 record, these Bulls never stopped trying. They were in a lot of these games. He said there's a lot of late games or a lot, a lot of late game, uh, you know, turnovers or just losing it at the end. So, you know, the few plays go differently, you know, when a lot of those young youthful mistakes start going away, this team could be, you know, go back from that one eleven season to, you know, uh, to eight, nine, 10 win season. Um, but yeah, a lot of youth and you saw a lot of that youth and an experience uh, be exposed during this regular season. So now uh, we'll go in and look at Mississippi State, another coach that just left one of his uh, previous school, got a new head coaching offer. Uh, Coach Barker was at Appalachian State the previous year, had just won the Sun Belt Conference Championship game, and Mississippi State gave him a call during the offseason and gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. And, of course, any, most coaches in this league will, you know, are, are salivating an opportunity to be playing one of the best conferences in college football in the SEC. Um, we know the view of the media and how they view the SEC. And, of course, a team when a team comes knocking and they're in the SEC, and you have a hard time not wanting to consider it. And Coach Barker got that call. He got that offer, and he went off to Mississippi State to be their new head coach. And had a pretty good season, uh, seven and five. You know, a lot of people would think, well, that's not that great, but it is good when you play at this high caliber of uh, opponents. Um, you know, the the opposing team record's not as good as what Buffalo had to face, but still pretty pretty not so bad, seventy four sixty eight. They did play some really really good teams. Um, I would have liked to say the high point would have been that game against Hawaii, but. Uh, we know that uh, Coach Carter that week um, had some personal issues going on and had to step away from the team for the week, and his assistants took over that week. And Mississippi State ended up blowing out Hawaii, who we'll talk about them later, had a phenomenal season this year. Um, yeah, small, but, price, small price to pay for, uh, for that orphanage uh, that uh, Coach Carter uh, you know, ran into when he was on fire. Uh, credit, big credit to the Honolulu medical staff. Uh, and on the Big Island there, uh, and able to able to, to treat those burns as quickly as they did, and get him back out on the sideline as quickly as they could. Uh, but you know, obviously, that was one of the high moments of the season throughout all of League One to, to see that that heartwarming story uh, where he was able to save those six kids. Yes, it was it was a truly inspiring story, and I think it. Uh, we'll talk. This, we'll see it later when we talk about Hawaii. But it, I think it might have helped motivate his team to just you know play play all out for him. Uh, but we'll get there when we get to Hawaii. Um, the low point for the Hawaii 
is going to be that loss um, against Washington, uh, not having, you know, in, in the Barker Bowl, it's, it's the way Washington finished the season, how they're playing this year, the assistant's not really doing as good as Coach Barker, his brother, was doing. Uh, you know, a lot of disappointment there at the at, at the University of Washington with the assistants, um, knowing that uh, how how poorly they performed after such an amazing year the previous year, and uh, Coach Barker goes on the road again against his brother's team without his brother there and uh, not able to get the win there, and so that was kind of disappointing uh, for them. That's one of their biggest lowest points, and the big high point. Uh, I would say is getting that win on the road against currently now ranked number seven, Texas A&M. Uh, that's a big time win for this program. That's a really good established program, Texas A&M. Uh, not an easy and not an easy team to beat. Uh, when you go to College Station, it's it's tough to beat those those guys there, and they did it. Um, so it was a really really big victory for this team. Uh, again, um, after you know beating Auburn, who turned out to be they were ranked when they played them, but uh, turned out that they didn't have a very good season, and um, due to league rule or league penalty, he was unable had to get a forced loss against LSU. And, sorry, uh, that, that, that hurricane in Baton Rouge. Yes, so he he got just absolutely demolished for that one. Uh, that high point is that Texas A&M win. That was a big time one there because it was their first look at a good SEC team and where they were able to play with them the whole time and able to knock them off. So that was a big time win for them. And, well, I, think, you know, and I remember watching that game and, uh, you know, I, uh, I immediately, as soon as the game was over, uh, I, I couldn't resist. I had to give Coach, uh, Coach Parker a phone call and congratulate him on his performance. Um, it was probably one of the best games I've ever seen him play in terms of uh, play calling and, and keeping things balanced and, and staying calm in, in, a, in a deficit situation uh, and uh, coming back there with 16 unanswered points in the fourth quarter uh, to pull that out of the fire pit. He had the two touchdowns and the two two-point conversions uh, there in the fourth quarter, um, pulling it out there on the road. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously when, when he and I spoke, uh, he revealed the real bombshell, which was that uh, you know he had developed uh, a whole new uh, game plan, a whole new play style. This you know he had the Hawaii game the week before uh, was the first game uh, after the hurricane, and uh, that was a user game. Uh, and uh, you know to go in uh, at, with and against a very difficult um, established program on the road with a brand new uh, game plan. And play the way that they did that week, uh, you know, really uh, said that they were actually going to make a run for the division. And there was talk uh, for a few weeks about Mississippi State contending for the division, which would have been unthinkable at the start of the season, really, uh, with the, with the, the season that the Bulldogs had last year. Um, but uh, you know, they ripped off uh, those four straight wins, um, and uh, you know, had the three losses late. Uh, the Tennessee game was a heartbreaker. That was decided very late, and obviously, as you mentioned, the Washington game. And then, of course, uh, you can't really fault them for losing to the eventual SEC champion, uh, Alabama Crimson Tide. Um, the Tide did, in fact, win the SEC. And, in fact, Mississippi State, uh, at 6-3 and three in the SEC, uh, finishes very highly in that conference. Uh, that's a very difficult conference. And uh, under Coach Parker, for them to come in and go 6-3 and three in SEC play, and uh, make some noise in that division in year one, uh, you know, speaks well of the future. Oh, yeah. There's any coach that can come into that conference and able to pull off that kind of a record in their first season is it's, it's a major, major accomplishment. So I have nothing but excitement to see what Coach Barker can do uh, with Mississippi State there. I, I, I see a bright future for them. I mean, it's just I, I honestly think it's going to just go up from here. So super excited to see what he does in the future. Yeah, there's another team I'm excited about, uh, and that's the Central Michigan Chippewas. Um, you know, last season they had their breakout starring year uh, when they cracked the top ten and got as high as the top five toward the end of the uh, end of the season. 
Uh, and even, you know, in, in some circles and in, in some late season weeks were even mentioned as a possible national title contender. That was how magical their Cinderella season was last year. So it set expectations really high coming into the season. Uh, of course, you know, if you remember uh, the season prior to that, um, Central Michigan had made a bowl. And then, in fact, it actually made a bowl the year before that as well. So they, they have made three straight bowls, uh, winning, winning two of them. Uh, coming into this season, no, sorry, winning one of the three bowls coming into this season. Uh, and, you know, expectations high. They start the season ranked really highly. They have the prestigious uh, one versus two matchup to start the season, uh, hosting our uh, my Syracuse Orange. Um, and that was a tight uh, affair. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a great performance performance. Uh, by Coach Luce, uh, great performance by uh, the Central Michigan Chippewas. Um, they played outstanding defense. They they uh, they had uh, they had they certainly had their share of the 50 fifties, uh, where they won out uh, on some of those inch plays, and uh, were able to uh, to force overtime, which is where Syracuse prevailed. Uh, but they certainly pushed hard in that game, and they showed that. Uh, you know, last season might not have been a fluke. Uh, the next uh, next week, uh, tough user game uh, against the opponent that uh, they had they had not faced off against each other before. And uh, you know, uh, coming off of the uh, the Syracuse game, might have taken a little bit out of Central Michigan going into that brawl and make things up for loss on the road. Of course, that's an awful long trip um, from Ypsilanti uh, all the way out to Honolulu. Um, and then, of course, uh, they had the bye week to sit there at 0-2. Uh, but following that, they had a couple of back-to-back -back marquee wins to really get the season turned around. They went down uh, to Florida State the week after hosting the Irish and against uh, Notre Dame and Florida State. Back-to-back -back huge wins over uh, some top 25 opponents. Um, you know, Florida State, uh, Seminoles in Duke. Campbell Stadium, Notre Dame, anywhere, um, you know, and they came out to play. Central Michigan uh, did their part and got close wins, crossed their keys and down their eyes, and then uh, rode that momentum for a few weeks, put up buckets of points. Um, towards the end of their season, they started playing, um, you know, 9-3 Kent State, 8-4 Ball State, uh, and uh, they had a few games on the road. Um, there to close out. The Kent State game, um, probably uh, the low point, but that was at a point in time when we didn't realize that Kent State's halfback was going to be a Heisman contender. Uh, we'll get, get, to, get to, to them later, but that Kent State halfback uh, beat up on Central Michigan as he beat up on everybody in the country this year uh, and was a big part of that game uh, for Kent State. And that kind of uh, shook Central Michigan a little bit. They were able to respond feet to the fire the next week in a very difficult user-user matchup in that MAC battle against Buffalo, uh, that burgeoning user rivalry between those two MAC coaches. Uh, and then, in fact, you know, the Ball State win, 50-20, uh, to 20 was massive. Uh, it was dominant. Uh, Ball State could do nothing to slow down the Central Michigan attack. And uh, it was those two games at the very end where Central Michigan fell off. At the time, they were ranked uh, in, in, in the top 25. They fell out of the polls thanks to those two losses. And really, if you look at those two losses, you kind of miss the forest for the trees. Because if you look at the entire schedule, you'll see Central Michigan was uh, actually two and four on the road this season. Had a little bit of trouble on the road. Uh, they were, um, you know, five and one at home. So, um, you know, a tale of two teams. And uh, one of those things that we, you know, we talk about with coaching, uh, you know, we've all had this happen. And sometimes uh, your team just does not perform the way you want it to on the road. You get, you know, maybe you don't get your fair share of the calls. That seems to happen more on the road. And uh, maybe uh, you have a couple of 50-50 calls that, kind of go the other way. That seems to happen more often on the road. I think every coach has, has, has heard these uh, these points before and is familiar with the, with the difficulties of going away from home. 
Uh, that was what kept Central Michigan from being ranked at the end of the season this year. But, uh, you know, coming from a program uh, that when he got there was uh, a regular 3-9, and 4-8 and eight team, and, uh, you know, they, they're getting ready, I believe, at 7-5, and five, and I believe with their ranking, they should go bowling. They should go to their fourth straight bowl under Coach Luce. And, uh, you know, we'll see how they do in that bowl game. But, uh, you know, remember, we've got 10 teams in this league, and uh, not everybody's going bowling. We, we, got, we got a couple of teams with users that are trying to rebuild, um, and uh, that's got nothing to do with their coaching ability. It's just the rotation of rosters. And then we've got, uh, you know, some coaches that are lucky enough to go bowling. I, I, I believe that Central Michigan deserves to go bowling. I certainly hope they do. And I'm excited to see who they face, up, face off against. Yeah, me too, Coach. I, um, I'm really excited for this team. Uh, they showed a lot of promise early in the season and fell through some adversity, and um, that's good for them. There is some there is some players on there that are still youthful, and, and facing adversity now is good for them, so it can help them be better t- players later because we know that Coach Luce is a winning coach. He can, he can take his team up there. I mean, like you said, last season they were up at the top five, even even had some whispers of the nat- that, you know, they might have deserved to be in the national title game. Um, they gave the Orange one of their toughest games of the season, who have it, who got tested maybe two or three times all season long, and it was by this Chippewas team. Uh, so this team got faced a lot of adversity and was able to come through some of it. Out. Absolutely loaded with young talent there uh, at Central Michigan. Yeah, so they got nothing but, you know, they have nothing to, but to look up. You know, of course, they had some disappointing losses. Uh, the Kent State one is a little disappointing just because they were on a nice little streak. You know, they just had three straight blowout wins in the MAC. They were kind of probably feeling a little cocky, thinking that they got this again. Kind of got woken up there at Kent State. And, of course, the Toledo game, I think that came and just was a punch in the back. They did not see coming at all. Uh, really didn't, I don't, it just, I don't, yeah, I think that one was just a big shock to them. And I just think the next week it was still, a, they were just still shook from getting beat by Toledo. But this team's got nothing but talent. They have a lot to look forward to. Uh, so excited to see. I do think they deserve to go bowling. And I uh, look forward to seeing that. But speaking of the bowling, you said teams not making it. We do have user teams that are not making the bowls. And the next team we'll talk about is one of them. Uh, there's some good things to look for, look at, uh, but there's a lot of bad as well. Um, Indiana, the, they have a really good roster. They have a lot of talent on this team, and they just had a lot of trouble sometimes getting it all pieced together. And it's not – they didn't get blown out by every single team. I mean, these guys were competitive. They were in so many of these games against so many of these good teams. Uh, they faced a lot of great talent this year. They won some really big games, but they lost some really good big games too. So, you know, there are times that things went for them, and a lot of times things were not going their way. Uh, they had a hard time not turning the ball over the quarterback. Uh, a lot more interceptions and touchdowns this year. So just the tail for Indiana is just turn, the turnovers. It, they had the talent there. They could put up yards. They could put up numbers. Uh, just turnovers was one of their worst enemies this season. Uh, in a lot of these games, a lot of them that came down to the wire and some not so much. Uh, a big high point for them, uh, obviously, that first win uh, where Coach Barker still was at Washington. This was this is a big-time fun rivalry. It's got deep history here in League One. This is an ongoing game every year. Coach Barker, uh, these guys, these guys two, these two face off against one another, uh, and... Indiana was on the losing end of, I think, uh, maybe a four or five year streak straight and was able to finally snap the streak and get the win. So that was a huge one. But I don't think any win was bigger this year than them finally getting over the Ohio State Buckeye hump. Ohio State, I believe, has beaten Indiana every year since the coaches showed up here. And this year in the shoe, they go there when they were ranked in the top 10 and knocked them off 27 20. Or it does not matter if coach is coach. They did finish four and eight, but I think that game was just huge for this program and huge for the team and something that they can really look forward to next year. This that game to me showed you why. Yeah, they're four and eight, but these this team was good. They had the players, they had the talent. They just couldn't 
piece it all together. I mean, other than really, I mean, Michigan State game was you know, lost by 28. The Penn State game was was ugly, uh, 58-17. Uh, but a lot of these games, you know, they lose to Rutgers by three. They can win that game. They lose to Purdue in a rivalry game by seven. They can win that game. You know, Wisconsin by 14. They can be in that a tough Navy team on the road. They lose that by 17, who goes 10-2. and two. They lose to Fresno State, and both those games just couldn't hold on to the ball. They lose to number four, Northwestern, in overtime. I mean, this team could easily have been 7-5, and 8-4 and four going bowling this year, but they just barely lose a lot of these games. It, a lot of it came down to turnovers. So this team was really, really good. They had lots of promise. Uh, they still have a really good recruiting class. They're still going to be good. So uh, I know the coach is going to get his team turned around and be even better next year. And I think he's going to point to that Ohio State game. He's got all the youth that he has on his team, the guys that are you know sticking around, He's going to look to them and say, hey, you know, we took Ohio State and we, you know, we went with them the whole four quarters and we beat them. And this is a good football team and we can beat anybody. So I think he's going to use that and try to build up for next season. Unfortunately, with that 4 8 record, they will not be going bowling this year. But again, you look at that opposition record, 88 55. So they played tough opponents all season long, too. And they got big wins, especially the Ohio State game. The Michigan State game, those are all big, big-time wins uh, for the Hoosiers. So there's still a lot of good to be from here. I know 4-8, and eight is, it's hard to look at. No coach really wants to say, well, 4-8, and eight, we did good. But they're still good that they can look at. They were in a lot of these games. Had things gone a little bit differently, like I said, this could have been a 7-5, and 8-14. and 14. That's, that's easily going bowling. They have the talent there. It's, it's definitely there. Uh, just – few things missing that they just have to get done on the field to be uh, a competitive, if not one of the better teams in the Big Ten. Yeah, you know, you said it's turnovers. Uh, turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. Um, and uh, if they can get that fixed next year, uh, Ohio State showed them what they're capable of. They showed themselves uh, what their ceiling is, and it's a high one. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, just like you said, uh, some close losses. They were almost there. Uh, if they can get that turnover problem fixed next year, uh, then I think we'll see these things, these, these 50-50s uh, turn, and uh, we'll see Indiana on the upward swing. Uh, speaking of the upward swing, uh, Navy, the midshipmen this year, um, exploded out of the blocks uh, and onwards and upwards, uh, anchors away indeed. Um, they, uh, last season and the year before, the year before that, kind of hovered around 500, maybe some six and six seasons, a seven and five here, a seven and five there. Uh, and this season they said, uh, we're going to try to conquer as many of our demons as possible. Um, they, uh, they went out and won their first two, uh, user games, back-to-back -back user games, both of them on the road, on uh, a close one there against, uh, your Fresno State Bulldogs, and then, Another uh, good, tough contest against Buffalo. And then in their opening uh, CPU game, uh, going to Huntington, uh, took on a very game, very difficult, uh, bowl-quality Marshall team uh, and uh, just gave up too many points. Uh, they were beaten through the air too many times. I think they had a key turnover or two, um, and uh, they got shook a little bit. In fact, they got shook so much that when they had their home opener against Cincinnati, uh, even though they had the lead in the third quarter, they nearly gave it away. They had a key interception uh, and uh, a couple of things go wrong in the fourth quarter to give up the lead. And in fact, Cincinnati had the lead and the football at 31-28 with less than two minutes left. Um, Navy was able to hold them to a field goal. And they held them to a field goal. That meant it was a six-point game. And uh, with, I believe, 19 seconds left, on third and 36, uh, Navy got the 60-yard touchdown play uh, on a miracle key through traffic uh, that, uh, that that saved that game out of the fire with uh, just seconds to go, 10 seconds, 12 seconds to go. Um, the big win over Indiana the following week after the Cincinnati win, they took off running from there. Uh, had a fire lit under their feet and uh, took that to a win at home against Indiana. Uh, then blew out Memphis, 
who had been a competitive team in years past, a little bit down this year, the Tigers, uh, and then the big one in week eight, the high point of the year, uh, I think it's fair to say for the midshipmen, if you take into account that it was SMU who they knocked off, who they won the tiebreaker with, to win for the first time uh, since they've had the conference to themselves, the Western Division, uh, they won the tiebreaker over SMU thanks to this game. They went into Dallas. And you have to remember that, that Coach Ninja, with all of his wins, all of his accolades, all of his championships, uh, came into this season with a 2-5 and five record all-time against SMU and had never won in Dallas. Uh, so when they, get, when they entered the fourth quarter trailing 24-3, hopes were slim. Uh, but in fact, the midshipmen and the United States on attitude of the academy was able to turn around the game and win 27-24 in overtime. They got the field goal at the start uh, of overtime and then held on for the win, rewarded for kicking the field goal. Um, in that SMU game, it was an exciting, uh, exciting affair. Um, they turned uh, another win the following week against Tulsa, then a bye week, and then a hiccup. Uh, a hiccup. In New Orleans, they lost to Tulane, uh, one of the lower points of the season. Uh, the offense uh, got a touchdown late to pull it to within 27-21, uh, but really it was a combination of uh, the Tulane defense doing enough uh, against the Navy offense, and in particular, the Tulane defense um, uh, you know, defense and offense combining, really. Uh, it, was, it was a bruising game. This is a competitive team. Tulane is a, is a, a tough team within the conference, certainly uh, can make some noise within that division. And, uh, you know, I think it was uh, two seasons ago in Tulane uh, that Navy uh, lost to them uh, in New Orleans. So that, that might be back-to-back -back, uh, losses in New Orleans. Uh, if not, it's two out of the last three New Orleans games between these two teams this year. Uh, a close affair, but Tulane gets the better of them. And a lot of teams could have said, well, you know, do we panic? Do we hit the panic button? Uh, they didn't have time to do that. They had a home game the next week against East Carolina that was a must win if they were going to stay in the conference race. In fact, from that point on, they knew every game was a must win. So they responded with a huge 38-25 victory. A, a, a win on many, many fronts against a very good team with an excellent 98 overall quarterback uh, that was obviously Coach Brack's team prior to Utah a team that had been built up by a youth uh, through uh, very astute uh, redshirt and recruiting moves. Uh, so that was a complete team that Navy beat uh, following that Tulane game. And uh, like I say, a lot of teams could have laid down the next week and let it affect them, but uh, they didn't. And uh, they performed excellently. They got the win. And, uh, you know, it was two weeks later. They didn't cool off over that bye week because they went out and shut out Southern Miss uh, in Southern Miss. 31 uh, nothing, and then motored on uh, in a snow game in uh, the Army Navy game, Army versus Navy in a very thick affair, and Navy emerges triumphant, 17 to 10. Happy to get the win by any means in that slugfest. They kept right on through, and they did in fact, uh, you know, get to the conference championship game. But, uh, yeah, Navy, Navy Ben Shipman, what a performance uh, to go to rip off a 10-2 and two season and, uh, and do what they did this year. Really bump up their win total from years past and, and, and kind of have, have maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit of a breakthrough here. Yeah, what a great season it was for the midshipmen. Having to get to play them myself, uh, I knew this team was made for something special, and they played a heck of a season. Uh, just nothing but praise for the midshipmen. Uh, they've always been a really good team. Uh, like I said, they've always set their run over 500. They've been competitive, uh, just a, like a similar story to a lot of teams. A lot of those games that were close, they just weren't going their way. This year, Coach Ninja made the changes and was able to get a lot of those little closer victories. I mean, it's just the hiccups that caused him to not have an even better season. Uh, but <clears throat> 10-2 is a phenomenal, phenomenal end of the season. 
And what's not shown there, when they played the Army-Navy game, that was a ranked matchup between the two. So a great game for America's game there, the Army-Navy game, and uh, able to pull that one in or pull that one off. And to ride off of that, another team that I, I'm, you know, out of all the users, um, I have to, I'd have to say the way this team played this year and the way that they finished, it has to be the biggest turnaround, one of the biggest turnarounds I've seen in a season for the co- for a coach to take his team. Last year, when Coach Carter took over the Hawaii Warriors, they finished off uh, five and seven. That was their final record in his first year. They didn't go bowling. Um, and, you know, he missed missed bowl season his first year. Five and seven record. This year, I think something snapped at Coach Carter, and he told his team that we will not be, you know, this, this is the only time that we're going to have a losing record. And he changed the culture in that program during that offseason, and this team came out an entirely different team. He changed up his scheme, the way he runs his offense, uh, more of a pass, uh, you know, pass, 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 going to pass it down your throat the whole time. Um, you know, that's that was his philosophy. That's how we got things done. You know, a lot of a lot of uh, rollout passes, things like that, quick pass pace, and changed his entire offensive scheme up and how he did things. And it was one of the great one of the greatest adjustments I think I've seen a coach make and have uh, so much success over that his team turned around and had a phenomenal season. Now the low points for these guys, one would obviously be the one where, uh, again, he went and saved those children. It's a phenomenal story, but his assistants unable to do anything against Mississippi state on the road. Um, so coach Carter's not there. So his only loss this year that he played, that he was the coach, very, very low point, that loss against 4-8 and eight New Mexico where his team got absolutely throttled, losing 72-49, to 49, just could not, did not have an answer for a team that was not very good this year at all. New Mexico was a very, very good team last season, but graduated most of their talented players and did not really replace them with anybody. So they were nothing compared to what they were last year. But Hawaii was not ready for that game and was not able to to do anything, and they, they lose that game. But after the 2-2 two and two start, Coach Carter gets a one-point victory over Boise State, and his team from there on just continues to roll. The big, One of the biggest things that I think is one of the high points of this season is a rivalry game between Fresno State, a home game, where they lost on the road last year in a user-user rivalry matchup between two guys that know each other very, very well, Myself and Coach Carter, uh, very good friends off the field, known each other for many, many seasons. So a lot rides on this game between the two of us just because of the the history we have with one another. Able to win that game big, 47-26, to 26, and his team continued to keep rolling there with the win over Colorado State. Win big time on the road against UNLV. Beat San Diego State uh, incredibly on the road against Nevada. And then to wrap up the Mountain West Western part of the division, they need to beat San Jose State on the road, and they do it 66 to 21 to finish their regular season at 10 and 2. So from a 5 and 7 record to 10 and 2 the next season is a, a monstrous turnaround. Uh, and really, Coach Carter goes 10 and 1 on this season. Uh, due to the again this the great story of him saving all those kids in the fire, saving six of those kids' lives, uh, you know, being the good Samaritan and pulling something like that, and his team, it, uh, does, his assistants, I say, kind of lets Coach Carter down and, able, and just not able to perform at all against Mississippi State. But while Coach Carter was here on the field, ten and one record with wins over Central Michigan. And Fresno State, so big time user matchup wins there, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that Air Force game uh, when we get to the conference championship. But a phenomenal season for Coach Carter and these Hawaii Warriors. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, I, I, I tell you what, Coach. Um, you know, I think we're 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 finally ready for to give it another shot, to, to give it another go, and come out with that uh, the, the third the third try, third version. Um, the Fantastic Four. 
Uh, we can make we can make that movie now because we definitely have Human Torch, uh, Coach Carter, uh, the superhero of the season, uh, and uh, and what a performance uh, by those Warriors. Uh, moving on to uh, my Syracuse Orange. Um, you know, uh, high expectations coming into the season, um, as any defending national champion uh, would have. Uh, especially in particular, um, uh, riding a 29-game uh, winning streak uh, coming in, and that was tested in week one. We talked about it when we talked about the Chippewa season. Uh, that first game, you know, it's first game's always tricky. First game's, uh, you know, if you, if you look at that Thursday night football game to start the NFL season, that's always a little bit of a, of a, of a kind of a, a messy game. Uh, this game, yeah, definitely. Uh, ugly you know, yeah, this game was was definitely um, you know a bruising uh, body blow game, and uh, we were fortunate to come out with the win in overtime, um, and uh, that was uh, that was really one of the few times that Syracuse was challenged this season. We had a very tough game against at the time uh, I believe number three Oregon, um, and we pulled away late in that one. That was a close one at the half. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, was a shutout. Uh, Rivalry game against Buffalo. Uh, we didn't know it at the time uh, that uh, Buffalo was going to have the record they did, but certainly the scoreline in that game, indicative of the difference in the records between the two teams, and certainly the, the difference in the rosters between the two teams. Uh, and that's always one of those real difficult situations where, uh, you know, you've got a friend on the opposite sideline, and you're throwing the kitchen sink in there, trying to melt the clock and trying to to get the uh, get that game locked up and, and get everybody out of there without any injuries and uh, you know safe and, and on the bus. Um, so got the win against Buffalo. Uh, a couple of road wins in conference uh, by fair margins. Um, and Louisville certainly is a bowl team. Georgia Tech's a bowl team. Oregon obviously a bowl team. Central Michigan a bowl team. Clemson will be will go bowling, no doubt. Um, Boston College, certainly not. That was a rivalry game. It was never meant to be this season. Uh, Utah, the user game, user-user uh, matchup there. Late season road user game. Always a difficult proposition. Uh, we were fortunate. Uh, we mentioned it uh, when we talked about the Utes, uh, that they had to go through three different quarterbacks this year. And in that particular uh, matchup, it was, in fact, the third stringer that Syracuse got to face. And that certainly was a factor in the game. Uh, but overall, a uh, great performance by the Syracuse uh, team on both sides of the ball saw us through that game. And uh, then the last two games of the season um, were much more uh, about avoiding injuries uh, than anything else. Um, we weren't challenged that often. Uh, we burned through most of the season. Um, the Florida State game was easily the closest score outside of user games, and uh, that was that was a tough battle. First, uh, Florida State's defense is one of the best defenses in the nation, uh, easily. I don't envy any any other user that might have to face them in a bowl game. Um, but uh, Florida State, Central Michigan, Utah. And uh, about one half of the uh, of the Oregon game were about the only moments were very much within doubt. Uh, although I will say that Boston College in that rivalry game they played they played a good half. They actually led us at the half or uh, in that in that uh, in that game. Believe it or not, um, or no, we, 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 we sorry, check check that. We were only ahead ten to seven uh, against Boston College at the half. Um, so. Yeah, uh, very few moments where we were we were really pressed, um, and uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, this is a team that we've worked a long time to build, and this particular year's team heavily heavily devoted to seniors. We've mentioned it before. Uh, Syracuse with nine out of eleven starters uh, on offense getting ready to graduate, including some extremely key players that have been starters for a number of years. We've got. Several, we've got at least three four year starters on defense that are leaving after this year, including our two star outside linebackers. Um, we're going to lose a lot of players next year, but that means that we have a lot of seniors this year and we have a lot of highly rated players this year, and they sure did play like it. 
Oh yeah, this team, uh, like we said, they were only truly tested maybe twice this year. Uh, the Florida State game. I mean, they might have had some close first halves, but no one has t- no one pushed this Orange team all four quarters, other than the Central Michigan game, which took more than four quarters as it went to OT, and Florida State. Uh, other than that, I mean, Syracuse kind of walked through a lot of these games and did not have anybody really push them. I mean, they put up 70 in a rivalry game against Pittsburgh, and oh my gosh, 98 points against NC State to finish the season. So this team is just on fire right now, and uh, like I said a lot of last season, there was Syracuse and everybody else. Uh, like the, I, the reference I like to reference all the time is the – they're, they're the Alabama of League One uh, to where it's just – it's it's you you got to play. It's them and then everybody else. Uh, there just hasn't been a lot of teams that have been up to the same level as the Orange. And, again, this year, Coach Schechter is able to come out here and, and you know, pr- prove it. To, sh- to say it's not a one-year State. thing. Florida State was the only team that got more than 20 points. Yes, uh, the the Central Michigan game went to to overtime, but uh, four states scored the most of twenty four. But give credit to Central Michigan; nobody allowed less points than than Central Michigan did. That's the lowest they scored all season long was twenty points. So, uh, but uh, yeah, just no one gave these guys much of a challenge other than Florida State and Central number Michigan. One, number one scoring defense in the nation. Yes. And lastly, we talk about uh, all this greatness of the orange, and we got to finish it off with Fresno State, which for me personally, 7 5 is not what I wanted. Uh, we can finish better than I, than I have all seasons. First year was 6 and 6, last year was 7 and 7 because we did go 7 5 to make the Mountain West Conference Championship game where we did lose. And we lost our bowl game because we've lost two straight bowl games, uh, but not against bad teams. Had a, a lost a close game to Notre Dame, and last season lost uh, a almost comeback win against Clemson. So still good quality programs, but none, but not able to win any of those in the previous years. Uh, so this year I really wanted to to set you know as a coach, you you want to every year that you play you want to set your bar a little bit higher than it was the previous year so we had won the west and made it to the conference championship game so my expectation that coming into this year was uh because i i did lose a i did lose a very very good quarterback in comstock Stephen comstock was a very great quarterback uh but we still had a, a pretty good guy there behind him not at the same level as him but still solid uh he did go down in the Wyoming game, and we did not have him for a good chunk of the season. He didn't really come back to the last game or two, so that did hurt our offense. Our offense was not as good without him. Um, but we, I, the we had the expectation to try to win the West again, and we really wanted to try to possibly win the Mountain West Conference Championship. Uh, worst case scenario, we wanted to definitely win the West and be there again because we did it last year. So not getting there this year, a little disappointing. Um, but we're trying to just look at all the positives and think, you know, if we can, we, we're set at seven and five. Uh, we finished what is it, six in the Mountain West. That should be enough to get us bowling this year. Um, but uh, so when, if we can finally win our first bowl game, finish eight and five. So at least that's one improvement. We'll finally win eight games of the season. Uh, so that'd be a one game improvement every year. Go six wins. First year, seven, the second, and eight, the third. So that would be a big one. But uh, started the season off very, very disappointing on the road against TCU. Got in a shootout with a team that had us outgone in every aspect of, the, of I mean, it just, they were just better and tried to outgun them, and it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, so we got completely demolished in that game. And then a very close user matchup, losing by three points in Navy, which we've talked about them and how they played. So that wasn't. A uh, that was a very good game that could have gone either way, and then on the road against a previous user coach, Appalachian State. This was an interesting matchup 
Uh, we were wondering to see how this team would do, and Fresno State was resilient and wins that one by three, which App State finished nine and three, so it's a good quality win there. And then the second user matchup, getting a big time win, a big one, 38-14 over Indiana, uh, and then a huge blowout over New Mexico. Uh, Fresno State remembered what happened last year in the regular season where they had a chance to win the game and unable to get a stop on a third and long. And New Mexico was able to run out the rest of the clock. But uh, they remembered that, and they just put the pedal to the metal against them. So three and two after that, they were looking like this might be pretty good. And then a really good Wyoming team had to go face them on the road. And a similar issue with Fresno State, you see with Indiana, they had a big time trouble with turnovers. And that put them in a big hole a lot of the times and just not able to make the just or not able to come back from a lot of those holes. Uh, but a really good team. Obviously, you see now at the end of the season, they're ranked 25, uh, 10 and 2 record there. So you see so far, the first three losses of the season are all teams ranked in the top 25 and finishing the season 10 and 2. Then they go on another bye week and on the road against Hawaii, another team that's 10 and 2 and lose that game. They have a trend of losing to teams that are 10 and 2. So these are good quality teams that they're losing to. But the problem is, besides the Navy game, they got they get blown out. They're blown out by Hawaii. They're blown out by Wyoming and blown out by TCU. But a common theme you also see here at TCU, at Wyoming, at Hawaii. So just not very good on the road this year. Uh, then they were able to pull out a, a very close game against Nevada on the road to finally end that losing streak. And the, and the road losing streak, winning 51-48 in overtime. The big-time rivalry win over San Diego State, putting them 2-1 and one against San Diego State since Coach Schwartz's uh, time here at Fresno State. And I think, honestly, the low point of the season for Fresno State, losing the rivalry game at home against San Jose State, which ended up making them have the same record conference-wise as San Jose State, making them finish third in the West uh, so that was really the low point. I know there's other big losses, but those are against good teams. But losing that San Jose State game at, the, at home was just so disappointing. And that came on a fourth down play where Fresno State had a chance to try to score and San Diego State kept them out of the end zone with zero seconds left when on a fourth and goal play where they could have tied it and made it go to OT or who knows, try to go for two just to win it. But San Jose State had a huge play in the red zone on fourth down at the very end to, to win that one. That was a heartbreaker. So that was definitely, definitely the low point for the Fresno State season. But they did bounce back and win by 10 against Utah State and a big-time win against UNLV. Uh, the highest point for them uh, really is that, that Appalachian State game. It's the really only good quality opponent they played that they won. Uh, Talent-wise, Indiana was one of the best talent teams that they played and beat. Um, but those two are probably their highest points those games just because Indiana's talent. Appalachian State had a lot of talent, too, and finishing 9-3. Uh, so 7-5, and five, no, obviously they missed the conference championship game. Uh, so we are disappointed about that, and we'll have to see what happens when the Bulls get released. I definitely think we should go bowling. Uh, and... Um, Let's see what happens there. I uh, can't say right now. We're not going to speculate in the future. Um, uh, not 100% sure. I, as I am eligible to leave, I've done my time at Fresno State. I don't have the certain league rules of being able to leave, so I am able to receive offers. Uh, so as of right now, I will look and consider the offers. There has to be one that I just – believe is is something that is big and uh, something that I think really would call to me um, but uh, we'll, we will have to see we will definitely have to see what happens there if we uh, if we decide to go if we decide to go elsewhere for the Fresno State but uh, as of right now I am the head coach of the Fresno State Bulldogs and uh, I we will be Looking forward to our bowl game, and we're going to try to win that game as I want to win a bowl game. We have not won a single one yet, so I'm hoping to get our first bowl victory this year, and we'll worry about the rest of that when we – we'll worry about the rest of that news whenever we get there. But um, 
quickly I'll talk about uh, some of the biggest players. And I'll start off, I'll go with Fresno State as of right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, one player, you know, each of the teams we talk about, we'll just quickly kind of talk about one player we think that stood out to us. And uh, for myself, just because I left off of Fresno State, it's Ronnie Beard, the wide receiver. Uh, it's a sophomore retro. He's a transfer, came from UCLA. Um, and uh, – he sat out his first year last season. This was his first year being able to get on the field and was able to have big yards, went over 1,300 receiving or receiving yards on 55 re, uh, receptions. And um, just a big – he provided the big play for, for Fresno State. Uh, all of the big plays pretty much came from him. There's a few other players that had some big plays, but he was the biggest difference maker in the biggest plays. So I think he's going to have – being only a sophomore redshirt – he, he could be here for at least two more seasons. I think he'll make a big impact for the Bulldogs for the remainder of the season. Or for his remaining of his career. Um, Hawaii, Stephen Salas, the running back. Uh, we mentioned how Coach Carter had to change what he was doing. And he trusted his running back. And his running back came up big. Uh, had over like 200 and or 200 and something carries, ran clear way over 1,000 yards. Uh, this is, like we said, something you don't see Coach Carter do a lot. He's not a big – he's never been a big running back – or running team in general and changed up his scheme, and it provided – it was big time for him. And his running back was the big difference maker. He was huge for his team and helped them win a lot of those games. Indiana – uh, you know, we did talk a lot of bad about Indiana. There was a lot of things we could pick uh, about this team, but there's a lot of promise. Like we mentioned, there's a lot of promise in the team. And someone who stepped up for this team that it's going to be very promising is Corey Ostrider, the fresh, true freshman tight end, uh, led his team in receiving. He had almost 1,000 receiving yards as a tight end, as a freshman. He's a redshirt freshman. He's still a freshman. So there's th three more seasons possibly with this guy. Uh, already leading the team and receiving yards and receptions. So lots to look forward to with this guy. Um, yeah, tons and tons of uh, positive for him. And with Mississippi State, we're going to go a little bit defensively. Uh, DeAndre Fitz Hundley, the left outside linebacker, uh, this guy's lightning fast all over the field. Big time difference maker for that Mississippi State defense. Had 33 sacks on the season was just huge for that defense. I believe he had 44 attacks for losses. So just all over the field, lightning fast speed. This guy was incredible for the Bulldogs and was just an amazing player to have. Uh, just big time for his team. Big, big, big time for his team. And last team that I was covering, the Utah Utes, their strong safety, senior strong safety, making so many plays. Dalvin Entry was big for his team. Was just had led was uh, tied for the most interceptions of four on the season. One of the best, uh, third best for the solo tackles. Was just a leader for the defense and a team that relied on their defense a lot in a lot of their uh, games to help get them the win. So a big time playmaker for his deep, for his team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gidry, uh, Jalvin Gidry uh, and uh, Fitz Henley both, uh, a couple of really promising defensive players uh, for some of these teams. Uh, we're starting to see some of these users, uh, user coaches, uh, build out some nice defensive squads. Um, looking at uh, some other uh, other players around League One, uh, looking at uh, uh, Navy, of course, uh, that's an easy slam dunk one. Uh, their player of the year this year uh, was senior quarterback Reggie Hayes. He is a multi-year starter. They are truly going to miss him when he's gone. Uh, this season, he came in and threw for 2,400 yards, ran for almost 1,000. He's got, um, he's got uh, a whole lot of... Uh, games under his belt. He's got a whole lot of wins under his belt. He's got a whole lot of plays 
that uh, that were you know comeback plays when he was exhausted. Um, and uh, you know for Buffalo, uh, you know we got one going out on uh, heading on his way out in, in Hayes, and we got one uh, coming in with Kirk Cousins, the freshman redshirt quarterback. Uh, he's positioned well, positioned to be a four-year starter for the Bulls, and uh, he got underway this year. I uh, showed some promise in some games. Uh, had a few interceptions, but of course that's going to happen as a freshman, and uh, he's shown a lot of promise. He is, uh, he is the bright spot for the Bulls, certainly going to be a big factor in how they compete moving forward. Uh, for the Chippewas, uh, that's another slam dunk. Uh, Clemente Guili, um was masterful once again, uh, multi-year starter uh, for the Chippewas. He had 1,100 yards rushing with 11 touchdowns, 700 yards receiving on 88 receptions for another seven touchdowns. Squilly, uh, the offense ran through him more so than anybody else, and he helped the Chippewas put up buckets and buckets of points. For the Orange, um, if I were to pick uh, a player, uh, that uh, really was an integral part. Uh, you know, the easy one is the slam dunk pick. Um, and we'll talk about him here in a minute. Um, but I'm going to go, um, I'm going to go in a different direction here and uh, say that, you know, if you're, if you're talking about a team that led the nation in points allowed, uh, you got to talk about the defense. And uh, in this case, uh, that defense, um, you know, the, 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 the linchpin of the defense, Kevin Green, on his way out, a four-year starter, um, he is going to finish with uh, over 200 career sacks, I believe, and um, has been a dominant force for the Orange uh, for an awful long time. We'll be sad to see him go. Um, speaking of awards, um, we have one in particular that's uh, rated a little bit higher than some other awards. Yes, the Heisman Trophy uh, obviously is one of the most sought-out awards for any player. I know all every player when they step on their campus, you know, they all want to go and win national titles, and that is so huge. But you know, every single player in them also thinks, you know, it's pretty sweet to win the Heisman Trophy because it is one of the most prestigious awards in college football. Not knocking any of the other awards, they're all uh, excellent awards. And it's honored to win any of them, but to call yourself a Heisman Trophy winner is just an amazing thing, an amazing feeling. And uh, so there's, we got a few players here. Uh, these are our five, five, five finalists that are going to get the invitation to be there for the presentation of the award. And you have Kenavasa from Syracuse. You have Means, the quarterback from Northwestern. You have Lowe, the quarterback from West Virginia. Nance, like we mentioned earlier, the running back from Kent State. And you have Hooker, the QB from Virginia Tech. All these guys playing excellent football. Very, very deserving of the award. And I'm going to let Coach Specter go a little bit more about the, each one of these players. Yeah, um, you know, obviously any one of these players, a fine, uh, fine specimen, Taylor Vasa, um, has won it twice before. He's looking to win his third Heisman. Um, and uh, while his passing numbers are certainly down this year, uh, that's absolutely indicative of an entirely different offensive philosophy that was much more run heavy. And, uh, you know, he's uh, currently sitting at 24 73 rushing. So um, he's certainly doing his bit on the ground. He just recently shattered Barry Sanders' Uh, 1988 record for rushing yards in a season. Jesse Means uh, performing for multiple years, very, very high level for Northwestern. He's a junior quarterback. Um, he just threw 300 yards in the rivalry game win against Illinois uh, with three touchdowns. And over the season, he's got over 4,000 yards passing and has tacked on to that almost 700 yards rushing for a grand total of over 4,800 yards of offense with 61 touchdowns, uh, just monstrous arcade-like, video, almost video game-esque numbers for Jesse Means. Uh, Trey Lowe, the senior quarterback for West Virginia, took them all the way to the Big 12 Conference Championship game, 
um, and uh, attended two seasons. And uh, over the course of the year, ripped off 3,000 yards passing and 800 yards rushing. He's got 50 total touchdowns and is sitting solidly there in third place. Isaac Vance, we talked about him a little while back. Um, he was a breakout star from the mid-major conferences. Uh, if you want to talk about any, or who might have been the best player outside of the power conferences this year, uh, you certainly could make a strong case for Isaac Vance. Uh, 1,600 yards rushing on the season with 16 touchdowns and 282 yards receiving with eight more touchdowns. Uh, the engine of that 9-3 and three and uh, conceivably ranked Kent State team. Hendon Hooker, the quarterback for Virginia Tech, rounding out the list, uh, he kind of put the team on his back and carried them into uh, into the, uh, the conference championship game there in the ACC and back into the rankings. Really a resurgence story for Virginia Tech this year, and, and Hooker really the engine behind that with his near 3,000 yards passing and 674 yards rushing for 35 total touchdowns. So some multi-purpose quarterbacks uh, uh, dominating the list. Tana Vasa, um, almost a running quarterback. You know, you'd say easily in the past he was a running quarterback, but he's, the, you know, he's, he's almost more so a running quarterback than he is a multiple threat quarterback uh, this season. Um, but uh, and then and then of course Vance rounding out the group. Um, but we do have uh, some breaking news. Um, in fact, they have just announced um, the uh, the Heisman uh, just now live, uh, and it's Taylor Vasa winning his third Heisman Trophy. Uh, this this just in: Tommy Taylor Vasa wins his third Heisman Trophy award for the Syracuse Orange. From the quarterback position, his 68 total touchdowns, uh, 5,700 yards of offense, enough to dominate the field, in fact. Uh, Tinovasa receives 637 first-place votes. That might be a record for first-place votes. Uh, anything over 400 should win it for you. 500 is special. To get 637 first-place votes, uh, you know, you got, you got to believe the uh, the 16 people that put him third place, uh, they, but you might be hard-pressed to find anybody that put him fourth. Um, means low, rounding it out, Vance, and Wallace uh, sneaking in there at the very end. Wallace, the quarterback uh, for Oklahoma State. Uh, Oklahoma State, of course, coming away with that huge conference championship win last week to win the Big 12. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, taking a look at these conference championship games uh, from this past week, uh, Navy pulled out a huge overtime win over USF, uh, 37 to 34. Uh, USF was ahead in this game, 28 to 10, in the third quarter, uh, and uh, Navy was able to rally and fight back as they did several times during the regular season and uh, tie the game up, send it to overtime, where a touchdown in the bottom part of the first overtime won the American Conference Championship for Navy, number 23 Navy. Uh, and uh, they, are, they are this year's American Conference Champions. It is the first American Conference Championship for Coach Ninja since all the way back in season three um, of uh, League One. Or check that, uh, actually, of, uh, uh, yes, no, that, that, that's true. It's season three of League One. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the last few years, uh, we talked about Navy looking to improve. This year, they get it done. They go 11-2 with that 37-34 overtime win over USF, Navy's first American title under Coach Ninja. Uh, out in the Mountain West, uh, that conference championship between Air Force and Hawaii Number two ranked Air Force, undefeated coming into that game. And uh, the Hawaii Warriors, we just got done talking about what a great job uh, the Cuban Force did out there and uh, in turning around the Warriors uh, by, a, by, a, by a margin of five whole victories, uh, improving five victories on last year. Uh, they weren't enough. Uh, they didn't have enough. It wasn't their day. Uh, they fought hard to get there. But when it was all said and done, um, 
you know, Air Force is undefeated in the right second for a reason. And they were the better team on the day, not by much, but by enough. And they came out of that game with a 41 to 30 victory. Out in the Pac-12, Utah, under first year head coach Brad, takes on number three, Oregon State, and pulls out the 24-21 win over Oregon State, Utah winning on the road in Corvallis. Uh, they got up to an early lead, uh, an early couple of score lead. They led 17-7 at the half. And in fact, uh, Oregon State was lucky to have points at the half. Uh, they scored only uh, barely before the half, a monster run uh, where they caught Utah a little bit off guard. And uh, outside of that, Utah down in the first half was able to hang on in the second. Um, they had... They had a couple of uh, close calls in the second. They they missed. They took, they took a huge gamble late in going for a fourth down. And when they didn't make that fourth down, they lit a fire under Oregon State. Oregon State fought hard, brought it back within a score, but uh, just wasn't able to get it done at the very end. And it's the Utah Utes. A uh, magnificent job by Coach Brack in his first year out there at Utah. In the ACC, Syracuse, the number one ranked team coming into the game, facing off against that 19th ranked Virginia Tech Hokie team. We talked about uh, Hendon Hooker leading back into the fray in the ACC. Virginia Tech uh, pleased to uh, have completed their turnaround, but got turned around in the conference championship. Never really much of a threat as Syracuse led almost from start to finish, uh, winning 49 to 13. And that was the end of the conference championship week. And that brings us into the bowl games. Uh, Coach, do you have any thoughts on uh, on the bowl games before we have uh, the big reveal? Yeah, I'm excited to... The bowl games just got announced. We've got a, a stack of envelopes here. And uh, some, some coaches are just about to find out where their teams are going. The bids are in. The bids are in. And we have news, folks. Yeah, so we have uh, we got some games to announce. We'll quickly talk about them, but we're going to go down the list as we see them. Um, we'll start, obviously, with all our users. Uh, we'll look at those ones, and then we'll look at – maybe we'll look at the end at this, the New Year's Six Bowls. Um, but uh, – What's the first reveal, Coach? First reveal, the first game that's on tap here is – the New Mexico Bowl, and we have a user in that bowl, and we're working on getting that up there live so you can see it, the big announcement, and boom, there you have it, the first bowl announcement of the 16th season, Fresno State will be taking on USF in the New Mexico Bowl this year. So the first user game um, of the 16th season of the announcement. Uh, obviously, we're going down the list of the uh, games that are in, in, in date order uh, from... Yeah, no, uh, if, if, uh, if you're talking about the New Mexico Bowl matchup there, um, and, uh, you know, the, that, that matchup, you know, we talked about Fresno State's matchup and, uh, in the last couple of bowls, and um, it was a tough matchup. They had uh, Notre Dame two years ago. They had Clemson a year ago. This year, they have uh, USF, and uh, USF, a uh, very tough competitor. We just saw them in action against Navy in the American Conference Championship game. And that was a game where they pushed Navy uh, as far as Navy could be pushed. USF led 30, or sorry, 28 to 10 in the third quarter. So it'll be interesting. You know, they're uh, they're making the trip out west. It's not too far of a trip for the Fresno State faithful. But uh, that's going to be a, a very interesting matchup because Fresno State comes in with the fourth ranked scoring offense and the ninth ranked uh, uh, offensive yards per game. Meanwhile, USF has the ninth-ranked defensive yards allowed 
and the number one pass defense in the nation. So Fresno State's number three pass offense in the nation, facing off against the nation's best in the air at 154.2 per game. A shockingly low yards through the air per game for USF, not to mention Fresno State 124th in the nation with a minus 23 turnover differential. Minus 23 is going to take on plus 8. USF is 19th in the nation in the turnover department at plus 8. Not to mention the ratings difference. So uh, it looks, it looks, Coach, like it's uh, potentially maybe not as big a name as uh, Clemson or Notre Dame, but still a, 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 a very challenging matchup for the Bulldogs. Yeah, this should still be a challenging matchup. We're not going to look at USF lightly at all. Um, this is uh, my home is in Tampa, so during your off season, you know this is where I'm at and all those kind of things. So uh, you know, know the area, know the school very well. So yeah, we're not going to look tread this team lightly. Um, you know, I it, it's still going to be a tough team. It's still going to be a battle, but it's still a battle. I think we can win. Um, so we're super sorry for this game. Uh, excited to you know finally get to know who we're playing, and when we'll be playing, and where we're going to be playing. Honestly, really glad to not be in the Ponciano Bowl. It has not been our ally. It has not been our friends. Uh, both those two losses last year, uh, the two seasons before, have been the Ponciano Bowl. So I got to say it's a little bit of relief to see us not in that bowl. Uh, very excited. Speaking, about that. speaking of the Ponciano Bowl, yeah, did, nice. I, did, I, uh, did I read that correctly? You are reading that correctly. The next... User matchup game. The next, or I should say, user matchup game. The next. Are we got another user, bowl user in the Ponciano Bowl. We have another user in the Ponciano Bowl, and the funny thing about this matchup here is we're seeing Mountain West taking on another American team. Our back, the first two user bowl announcements is a Mountain West team facing an American Conference team, because you are going to see. The Hawaii Warriors take on the East Carolina Panthers in the Ponciano Bowl. Yeah, that's going to be a really interesting matchup. Obviously, you know, we mentioned uh, Coach Brack built up the Pirates. We saw them in action in American Conference play in a game against Navy earlier in the season. And that was a challenging game where Navy had to check the right boxes to get the win. They were able to do so. It will be fascinating to see whether or not the Hawaii Warriors are able to check those same boxes. They're going to come into the game with the, with the nation's sixth-ranked rushing defense, while ECU getting it done on offense, 15th-ranked yardage per game, and number five in the nation in turnovers. Hawaii, for their part, 19th, tied for 19th at plus eight. ECU at plus 10. Both of these teams know how to take care of the football. That may not, might not be the same factor that it is in other games. Both these teams averaging 38 and 39.1 points per game, respectively, 19th and 12th in the nation in the scoring. So these two teams know how to score. They know how to hang on to the ball. And uh, they know how to win football games. Uh, this will be an exciting, uh, exciting bowl game. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. Um, I... I, I really think it's going to be an entertaining game. Um, you know, I know as Hawaii being 10 and 3, they probably would feel like they should have been in a better bowl, uh, but still it's a good bowl. It's a good team that they have to face against someone they can't overlook. Um, but uh, it should be should be an exciting one. Very, very exciting one. I uh, cannot yeah, wait for that. Oh, absolutely. That 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 uh that record is very very um, deceiving. So the next announcement, our next game that's up on tap, 
We're staying not entirely with the same theme, but we do have an American uh, conference team, the actual American conference champions. They are playing in a bowl, and they will be playing the 23rd ranked Navy midshipmen who will be playing in the Little Caesars Pizza Bowl against a former user-led team in the Ohio Bobcats. I think I'm having some technical issues. I lost the feed to coach. One quick second. Here we go, coach. Uh, looking at the uh, the Navy Ohio game, uh, going to be an exciting affair. Um, it is. Uh, it's an interesting game. These two coaches, longtime rivals, uh, Coach um, Ninja and uh, Coach Doc Jocular, the now retired coach of the Ohio Bobcats. He is happily retired, uh, operating his yak farm in Southern Ohio and enjoying a well-earned respite from the stresses. He doesn't have to worry about facing Coach Ninja. The rest of the Bobcats do. A lot of his players still on that roster. They have a very good set of players. There'll be a challenge for Navy. It'll be interesting to see how that one goes. The 11 and 2 mid Navy midshipmen taking on the 8 and 5 Ohio Bobcats. And that'll be coming to you from Ford Field up in Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, I can't wait to see that one. Um, it's funny to think so far that we've already have two uh, users having to face old user led teams. Um, so cannot wait to see that one. That should be a great, great matchup. Yeah, the Bull Gods were nice to us this year. They, they were. They were pretty nice to us this year. Very, very nice to us. So speaking of the Bull Gods, we got our next matchup on tap here. Oh, this is a juicy one. This is a juicy one. We're headed down to the Cotton Bowl, the AT&T Cotton Bowl Classic where you will get to see the matchup of Mississippi State taking on 19th ranked West Virginia Mountaineers. Yeah, uh, Coach uh, R. Bark, um, you know, uh, he's got ties to WVU. He's got deep ties to WVU. And, uh, you know, he's uh, he's getting to play, getting to play one of his favorite uh group of people it's going to be a lot of friendly handshakes at the end of the game no matter what happens but it will be interesting to see what happens uh between the bulldogs and the mountaineers mountaineers coming into the game as you mentioned uh top 25 team at plus four on the year in the turnover department while mississippi state operating at minus 17 that puts them at 123rd in the nation in the turnover department uh, although they do have the eighth ranked uh, defense in terms of total yards allowed, they're going to need it because WVU has the seventh ranked offense in terms of yards put up. So uh, it'll be a very good WVU offense versus a very good Mississippi State defense. And it'll be up to the Bulldogs offense to hang on to that football and do their part and get out of here with a win in the Cotton Bowl in a matchup uh, that I think uh, is going to be quite the challenge for the Bulldogs. I think uh, it'll be a very interesting one. I can't wait to watch it. Uh, I think uh, I know I know Coach R. Coach R. Bark is, is really thrilled about, really thrilled and excited about this one. Yeah, I think he'd probably be absolutely excited about that one uh, because, you know. It's, it's the Cotton Bowl. It's the Cotton Bowl. It's a very prestigious bowl. It's one that everybody's known about. Uh, he gets to take his team against a really good team, a 10 and 3, 9 and 19 ranked West Virginia. Uh, so he almost gets to have his team have one last test to see if, you know, how are they going to go, how are they going to, you know, if they can ride that into the offseason and take that into next year. So I would be super ecstatic about that one. Uh, 
uh, especially like we say, you won't finish at seven and five and you get your team in the Cotton Bowl. You have to be absolutely thrilled to be able to be in a part of that game and to get to play a quality opponent like that. Uh, I think he's probably jumping for joy right now. So the next bowl game we have on tap for you, for our user matchup bowls, our user bowls, we're going to the BBVA Compass Bowl in Birmingham, Alabama, where you will get to witness the Central Michigan Chippewas taking on the Marshall Thundering Herd. What a matchup this is. A former MAC conference team in the Thundering Herd. Now, uh, having since moved to Conference USA and then further onwards to the American Conference, the Marshall Thundering Herd uh, went 5-3 and three in that uh, challenging uh, American Conference. Um, in fact, they defeated uh, Coach uh, Ninja's Navy Midshipmen, the champions of the conference. So Marshall knows how to take down teams that are better than they are, uh, maybe on paper. Uh, this will be – this is a sneaky game. This is a really sneaky game because uh, it's really easy to look at Marshall's 7-5 and five record and say, okay, well, it's a 7-5 and five team out of a mid-major. But at the same time, you know, like, like I just said, they, they beat a top 25 Navy team who won the conference, uh, and they've got some other feathers in their cap. And they also have the sixth-ranked passing offense in the nation, uh, along with, once again, we, this, is, this is beginning to, to become a trend. We see Marshall uh, at plus four in the turnover department, while Central Michigan coming in at minus 16 uh, to put them at 122nd uh, in the nation. You know, part of the problem for Central Michigan, uh, maybe towards the end of the season there, in a couple of those losses, uh, was turnovers. Uh, was potentially going to the well a few too many times on a few favorite plays. And uh, they can definitely, uh, against a team like Marshall, uh, get caught with their hand in the cookie jar uh, going to the well one too many times. Uh, this is this is a dangerous football team, I think. Yeah, this is one that, uh, especially the way that Central Michigan finished the season, they got to make sure that they are on their A game and cannot sleep on this team. Uh, I know that Coach Luce is going to want to you know, go down and, and finish off on a high note um, because he knows his team's a lot better than the record shows, uh, like we mentioned before earlier in the broadcast. Uh, well, you know, they, they certainly, the Chippewas have the capability. Absolutely. Uh, you I mean, saw in games against uh, Florida State and Notre Dame, uh, as well as Syracuse, that when they go into a game with that laser focus, and don't take any play lightly and assume that everything can go wrong in a heartbeat, they can knock off anybody. If they go into this Marshall game treating Marshall with the same level of respect that they gave to Notre Dame and, for, and Florida State as well as Syracuse, uh, then, they, then they, have, they have a chance. Yeah, absolutely. So they, he's got to come out here ready to play, have his players ready to go. Uh, it needs to be, like I said, on their A game. They cannot look at this team lightly. We, we, like you mentioned, this Marshall team has beaten Navy. Uh, so this is uh, this is a team they 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 have to be ready to play and they are definitely capable uh, of winning this game. Like you said, they big wins over Florida State and Notre Dame were no laughing matter. Uh, so this this Michigan this Central Michigan team can uh, either come out here and and play a really good game. I can I mean if they play their absolute best potential, this could they could either they could blow this Marshall team out. But if they come out here playing like they have against some of these other teams. It could be the latter. They could be the ones getting blown out. So uh, this, uh, this is a very intriguing matchup. I'm very excited to see this one. Uh, well, the vulnerability, uh, I just want to mention one last thing on this one. Uh, the vulnerability here, the, uh, the scale missing, if you will, in Smaug's armor is that Central Michigan is 96th against the pass. And Marshall is the sixth-ranked passing attack. Yeah, so that's so they certainly cannot afford those turnovers. Yeah, it's a possible, possible, uh, a big, big, could be, yeah, it could be a big issue for the Chippewas, but we'll, we'll find out when that game, uh, happens live. And now another, uh, big time matchup, one of actually the New Year's Six Bulls that we have in store for you. 
Uh, and uh, we kind of knew this would happen as we knew that Utah had won their conference championship game. So they knew that they were lost. And two, the Rose Bowl just had to find out who they were going to be playing uh, based off of who won the Big Ten. And a big game here in the 16th season, the Rose Bowl game is going to be between the 20th ranked Utah Utes and the 15th ranked Penn State Nittany Lions after their huge win over Northwestern in the Big Ten Championship game. Able to win that one and see their way into the Rose Bowl in this very amazing matchup. I can't wait to see this one between the Nittany Lions and the Utes. You know, it's the granddaddy of them all. It's the oldest bowl in existence. It's the most famous bowl. It is the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, and it takes place every year immediately after New Year's Eve. It's a, it's a, it's a legendary game, and Utah has punched their ticket. They're going to be facing off against a team in Penn State who has really come on late. Uh, they were in, they were kind of hanging around in the Big Ten East for a lot of the season, um, and not necessarily in first, but maybe in second and third most of the year, but never dropped too far back. Obviously, at eight and two in the conference, they couldn't have, but they shoot all the way up to 15th in the polls because they just knocked off, as you mentioned, uh, that top five Northwestern Wildcats team in the Big Ten Championship. Uh, as well as an impressive win over Indiana and a huge 19-point victory over Michigan State in the game before that. So uh, this team is red hot. Uh, it'll be dangerous, uh, and uh, they're going to be they're going to be coming in ready to play. Uh, and uh, it'll be a really good challenge for Utah. Um, the Utes obviously have had a great season. They're finally uh, just now, um, you know, in the in these last couple of weeks. Uh, getting some of their players back. They've only got one player out now with an injury, the Utes. Um, so they're almost at full strength, and uh, that could be a benefit to them. Um, the two teams, uh, an excellent matchup. Penn State with a little bit more on offense, and uh, Utah under the great coaching of Coach Brack uh, has had a really good season this year defensively, uh, operating the 16th-ranked defense nationally on the season. They're going to need it. Uh, facing off against the seventh-ranked scoring offense. Penn State coming into the game averaging a healthy 41.2 points per game. That puts them seventh in the United States. And and you want to talk danger, guess who's number one in the country in turnover differential? That would be the Nittany Lions. That's 15. Number one in the nation, plus 15 turnover differential. Yeah, that's incredible, uh, and that's why they're so successful. You know, if you can force turnovers and 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 capitalize on them, which they've done, you're going to win a lot of football games, and that's uh, been key for them and and help them lead them to where they are now. Um, you know, we saw them with the big win over Northwestern and the blowout win over Indiana, who just the week prior beat. Ohio State at Ohio State and comes home after that big win and is able to do absolutely nothing against the Nittany Lions because of that stout defense. So Utah's and Coach Brack is going to have his hands full with that matchup. But it, you know, it's he's been there before. He's he's played a lot of big games. He's he's done well with his team, and uh, I think he can get them ready for that game. It's going to be a really really exciting one, really exciting one. But last but certainly. Not least, the last user matchup game that we have to announce in one of the biggest games all season, it's the game that every single coach, when they first start the season, every coach wants to be here. This is the goal that every single player, every single coach, when they start practice in the spring, this is what they dream about. They can't, this, is the, this is it. This is what they all want. The national championship and the Syracuse Orange will be there again trying to defend their title as the national champions and they will be facing the second ranked Air Force Falcons which is an amazing match to see a military school after two phenomenal seasons last year they got cracked the top 10 even the top five I believe and here they are we're in the top five all season long and you get to see the Syracuse Orange try to defend their title against the second race, second ranked Air Force Falcons.
Yeah, uh, I'm with you. The uh, the matchup here, um, I mean, what a game. It goes beyond uh, even just this season. It goes beyond the fact that it is indeed the national championship. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a massive matchup. Air Force, as you mentioned, uh, top 10 last year, able to parlay that uh, into an undefeated season this year. Only two teams went undefeated. And therefore, they are the ones that get to face off for the title game. Air Force, one of the two undefeateds. Therefore, they are here. But looking at the numbers, uh, boy, what a matchup. Air Force coming into the game fifth in the nation in points per game with just shy of 42 points per game. 11th in the nation in offense. Third in the nation in defense. Fifth against the run. Eighth against the pass and a plus three turnover differential. For the Orange's part, they come in with a number one ranked scoring offense, the second ranked offense, and the first ranked defense. So both of these teams operating well, well inside the top 10 in a multitude of categories. Uh, these are the two teams that all season have beat all comers uh, and the two teams that, that uh, really everybody wants to see face off. Uh, but it goes beyond, uh, goes beyond that because Syracuse will be trying to do a number of things that have never been done before in League One history. Uh, one of them is to win a third consecutive national championship. Uh, that has never been done in League One. Syracuse, the Syracuse Orange, trying to win three straight here in this game against the Air Force. And additionally, uh, for my part, uh, our coaching staff, uh, is, is trying to win 43 straight games, which will, if we can get this win in this game, break the league one record for longest winning streak. So in one fell swoop, uh, to become the first team to win three straight and to become uh, the all-time leader in longest winning streak, uh, to do those both in one game would be quite the, quite the affair for Air Force's part. That is a scary defense. Uh, we saw them in action against uh, Hawaii. We saw them in action all year. This year, we saw them last year tear apart Fresno State of the Mountain West Conference Championship. Um, this is a scary, good Air Force Falcons team, and they deserve to be here. And it's just, it's so interesting to me with, with the number of categories for both teams in the top 10. It's hard to say if it's going to be both of the offenses that break out or both the defenses that break out. Um, you know, this could just as easily be 41-38 as it could be 14-10. Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. Um, I could see this going both either way. It could be a very low-scoring affair or it can be a shootout. Um, it really just depends on the preparation of each coach. You know, how well I know both coaches have been uh, excellent uh, excellent at getting their teams prepared for it, uh, each game. Um, but uh, – We'll just have to see which which side of the ball shows up. If the defenses show up or the offenses show up, um, this this is a, a, a one of those dream matchups. Uh, you'd love to see a military school, one of the military institutes, be able to have the success the Air Force Falcons have had. Uh, it's it's it difficult, very difficult for these military schools. Uh, we, you know, as we have Coach Ninja at Navy, uh, have to do it as well uh, because they're you know the the talent they have to bring in. These guys aren't just coming. You know, these, these schools don't go, oh, we're going to win all these national titles and, you know, things like that. The coaches have to – these kids are signing up for the military. I mean, you got to remember these guys are still serving at least four years when they're done with school. You know, they got to give their active duty years. These are these are servicemen and women that go to these academies. Uh, so, you know, some of those top-tier athletes, top-tier players don't necessarily want to, you know, join the military. And these guys are so – to see one of these military academy schools have the success the Air Force has had the last two seasons is just amazing because they just are it, – it's, it's, it's awesome to see it. And, of course, we mentioned Syracuse. This team's been dominant for the, for the last two seasons and now the third one. You know, like, we, like Coach uh, mentioned, trying to be the first team to win three straight national titles uh, in League One history. Um, yeah, just so much here, so much uh, history. Syracuse trying to pull something that hasn't been done in League One history, and, and Air Force trying to do do something as well. You have I don't I uh, you know haven't 
since uh, all the other schools started getting a lot better, you know, back in the old days, the military academies were pretty good at, uh, at college football, but uh, not as of late. And so, you know, trying to do something that has not been done in a very, very long time and cannot wait to see what happens in this national title game. Uh, it'll be super, super exciting uh, to see this game. And just to let everybody know quickly, we're gonna we're getting close to the end of the show. But uh, if you go to our the website, the League One, it's League One College Football dot com. You can catch all of the League One action and be able to see everything going on, including uh, now that the bowl games are announced. Our uh, most of our games should be televised because they are bowl games and they're big games, and so we will have all the announcements of the game times when these games should be played and where you can watch them. Uh, I know four of our users do stream on Twitch. I myself on the channel you are currently watching on, um, Coach Loose on his channel, uh, and as, as as well as Coach Ninja, and Coach Specter, both of them on Coach Ninja's channel. So we do have plenty of ways to catch League One live, uh, especially these bowl games, especially that national title game. Uh, but all of those games, announcement times will be on the website. And uh, because it's the bowl season, I will try my best to get some of the other bowl games. Uh, some of our players do not have the same kind of equipment as I, but I do have the capability of kind of restreaming their games in a way to where it can be caught live as well. So we'll try to have all that up there for everybody to see. If you want to catch some League One bowl game action coming to you live. So the last thing we have to go through quickly, uh, we might be able to go more in depth when we finish, completely finish the 16th season. Uh, but as of right now, we do have other. We mentioned the Heisman winner, uh, but there's more than just the Heisman winner. We do have some award winners. Um, uh, That's well. right. Yes. If you go to the award winners uh, and uh, you look at the lists, the first one that pops up, is the Maxwell Award. Uh, the Maxwell this year goes to Tommy Tanabasa. It is his third consecutive Maxwell Award. He beats out Jesse Means. Uh, that is offensive MVP. The other offensive MVP award, there's two of them. The Walter Camp Award also goes to Tommy Tanabasa, winner of this year's Walter Camp, also beating out Means for the award. Moving on to the Ben Eric. This one for defensive MVP, and this one for the fourth straight year goes to Kevin Green, the first ever four-time winner of the Ben Eric. And he has 240 career sacks. Also, no surprise, winning the Nagurski, Kevin Green, uh, beating out DeAndre Fitzhenley, that star linebacker we talked about earlier for the Bulldogs at Mississippi State as well as Jacob McKnight, an outstanding uh, defensive end, one of the best defender for the Central Michigan Chippewas. Uh, the Davey O'Brien Award, given annually to college football's best quarterback, uh, usually given to passers more than runners, but that's not the case this year, as Tanner Massa able to get it done with only 3,000 yards on the air. But the 68 total touchdowns, besting means by a couple and able to hold him off for the Best Passer Award. The Dope Walker Award. Dope Walker given to the nation's top running back each year. That goes to Isaac Vance. We talked about him. He's a Heisman candidate. He comes out of the back, but don't sleep on him. He is an outstanding back. And he had 1,600 yards this season for the Golden Flashes. The Boletnikoff. The Boletnikoff Award given to the nation's best receiver. That goes to Jace James, the Northwestern Wildcats, back-to-back -back Northwestern Wildcats, two different receivers, winning the Best Receiver Award. The the golf goes to Jace James, uh, Hunt, Ontario Hunt, uh, and Dixon for Marshall and Penn State, respectively. You'll see those two receivers in action in the BBVA Compass Bowl as well as the Rose Bowl, respectively. In the tight end race, the Mackey, the John Mackey Award, given to the nation's best tight end. That goes to Austin Jones out of West Virginia, the runner-up, White from Northwestern. The Outland Award. The Outland Award given to the nation's top offensive lineman. Any offensive lineman eligible, regardless of position, and three Syracuse Orangemen, 
fought it out for the award. It is Sam Heckle, the right guard, who wins that race over Joe Jacoby, also of the Orange, to nab the award for the nation's top offensive lineman. Those three for the Orange representing one of the country's best offensive lines, if not maybe the best. The Remington Award, given to the nation's best center. Hawaii, the Rainbow Warriors, supplying a major award winner, the, the Dan Remington Award, for the top center going to Solo Vaipulu of the Hawaii Warriors. And he nabs a major award for the Warriors at the center position, beating out two Trojans from USC. Moving on to the Lombardi Award, the Lombardi Award is given to the nation's top defensive lineman. Among those defenders who put their hands in the dirt prior to the snap, it was Jacob McKnight this year of Central Michigan, winning just the third major award under Coach Luce's history. Jacob McKnight with 24 sacks, getting it done on the defensive side of the ball. A monster there from the defensive end position for the Chippewas. He beats out Max Wright from AM. You saw them in action this season in the SEC. Best Linebacker Award, no surprise it goes to the Defensive MVP Award winner. That's Kevin Green. Uh, he beats out Fitz Henley again uh, for the Bulldogs of Mississippi State. Henley right on his heels with 33 sacks, and Green wins the award with a few more. At Defensive Back, the Thorpe, the Jim Thorpe Award, given to the nation's top defensive back. This one goes to Raheem Fuller out of Middle Tennessee State. He led the nation with 10 interceptions, a ridiculous total there in his senior season in Conference USA. There's Javelin Guidry, Javelin Guidry, the strong safety for the Utah Utes, the runner-up this year for the top defensive back, supplying a good part of the Utes secondary. The Groza Award winner, the Groza goes to the nation's top place kicker. That's going to be Matt Hill out of Arkansas State. Barely beating out Landis from Penn State. The Red Wolves kicker, Matt Hill, was 33 for 37 on the year. The Ray Guy Award. Ray Guy, the only punter in the NFL Hall of Fame, given to the nation's top collegiate punter on the season this year. In his freshman season, Reggie Roby wins it for Syracuse. He beats out Jamal Rawls from South Carolina. Nips him at the end there to win the best punter award. The best returner award. This one is often traded amongst users within League One. No surprise that three users would fight it out through the course of the entire season. And in fact, Braddock won it for a while last year. He finishes runner-up this year because Corey Stewart for the Bulldogs of Fresno State ripped off a few more yards and a few more touchdowns. Able to score four on kickoff returns and throw in an extra one from the punt return. That rounds up the award winners. Moving on now, Coach. Let's run through the first and second team of all Americans, the all NCAA teams. And uh, let's hear what you think. Yeah, so here we are with our all Americans on the first and second team. Obviously, we'll start with the first team. And no shock here as Sammy Tenavasa is the number one quarterback on the first team there, the quarterback of Syracuse. I mean, it's no surprise there he's the first team quarterback. And you look at the two running backs, Stevie Salas of Hawaii, the first running back list here, and Julian Ross, the running back from Hawaii. So you have a user quarterback, a user running back, and an ex-user run, uh, running back there uh, to round off the, or the first three all-American players uh, on the first team. The two wide receivers, Jace James, no surprise that he's there. And Xavier Martin from Texas Tech is the other wide receiver. Tight end Austin Jones from West Virginia is the first team All-American tight end. The starting lineman, Joe Jacoby from Syracuse at left tackle. You got center solo Valapula. From Hawaii, at right guard Sam Heckley from Syracuse. Right guard also Stanley Hubbard the third out of Air Force, and the last lineman on the All-American first team is Mike Clark, right tackle Syracuse. 
I'll let you take over the defense there, Coach. Yeah, my friends, Jacob McKnight for Central Michigan. The Chippewas land the starting defensive end. One of them, Navy, gets the other. The two defensive ends coming from the Chippewas and the midshipmen, Jacob McKnight and Jackson Perkins, making first-team All-American. Ryan Hardy, Penn State defensive tackle. He'll be in action in the Rose Bowl. And Carter for Northwestern's powerful program, supply the defensive tackles. At linebacker. We've got three user teams represented. The Syracuse Orange supply Kevin Green. Mississippi State supplies Fitz Henley. And Navy supplies Hampton. Between Kevin Green, DeAndre Fitz Henley, and Ronnie Hampton, I'd say that's a pretty deadly linebacking core. Champ Bailey starts off the secondary for Syracuse, the starting cornerback for the All-American team, and the nation's... Uh, Thorpe Award winner, Raheem Fuller, the other starting cornerback on defense. Brad Edwards, free safety for Syracuse, qualifies for first-team All-American, as does Javelin Gidry. Edwards and Gidry, two users, be, uh, supplying the two safety positions. Bailey at corner for the secondary. The special teams units, Matt, Matt Hill, Kicker for Arkansas State, along with Reggie Roby, the two award winners, no surprise there. They nabbed the first two kicking slots, uh, kicking and punting slots on the first team All-American, as does the award winner for best returner, Fresno State's ever dangerous, Corey Stewart. As we go off into the second team here, we'll, we'll go defense to offense this time. It's going to start on the bottom of the list here. So, no shock that you would think that the, sec the runner-up for the return of the year, Jermaine Braddock, he's going to be your second-team All-American returner. Uh, the punter, Jamal Rawls, the sophomore from South Carolina, and the kicker, Carson Landis, the senior from Penn State. That's going to be your special teams players there for the second-team All-American. The strong safety, Billy Gibson out of Oregon, and you have free safety on roll from Syracuse. And to round out the last secondary position, Stephen Davis from Miami and quarterback Donovan Johnson out of Penn State. That's going to be your secondary for the second team. Linebackers this time, instead of two left outside linebackers, it's two right outside linebackers. And you're going to see Keyshawn Wilson out of Old Dominion making the second team All-American. And Jamal Weiss from TCU. And middle linebacker Ellis Brooks out of Penn State. A lot of Penn State players represented here. On the defensive line, you have defensive tackle, tackle Robert Buchanan out of Baylor. Another Big 12 uh, player, Javon Davidson out of Oklahoma State, a defensive tackle. And the two end positions are rounded out by Max Reich from Texas A&M. And Giovanni Revere from Old Dominion. So two Old Dominion players making second team All-American. And as you mentioned, Coach, Penn State with a few on the second team, a few on the first team, as well as a lot of user players this year making the All-American teams. Looking at the second team offense, Jesse Means, the quarterback for Northwestern, gets the start for the second team All-Americans. And Vance... The Doak Walker, a winner from Kent State, he gets bumped by Ohio's and Hawaii's running backs. They had a few more touchdowns. Vance has the yards, and he gets the spot on the second team. Along with Ryan Rucker from Wyoming, a big piece of the Cowboys' ascendancy you know, up into the top 25 rankings. And uh, a proud marker there for the Cowboys uh, as they continue to improve that program. Steve Coleman. Keith Gilmore, the two wide receivers from Miami and Texas A&M, respectively. Eric White, the tight end out of Northwestern. A lot of offensive players, as usual, from the Wildcats, making both the first and second team. Two more Syracuse offensive linemen make the second team All-American list, and that's uh, Dakota Davis and Patrick Davis at tackle and guard. And that means that all five Syracuse offensive linemen made either first or second team All-American. Yeah, that's a poise for success right there if I had seen one. I mean, 
if, if you have a good offensive line, your offense can do a lot of different things. They can run the ball, you got good pass protection. Uh, so you, that just shows how well uh, Get, yeah, getting getting uh, Pardon? Oh, as it says, it shows you how good Coach Spectre has been and bringing the talent and developing them there. That he's got these guys. He's got all five of his starting linemen, either first or second team All Americans. Yeah, and uh, Carter from Navy at guard, along with another Air Force offensive lineman. One of them made first team, and one of them makes second team offensive line for the Air Force. Jackson McDowell qualifying a tackle there to round out the offensive line. So we have uh, Navy with a few. We have Syracuse with a few. Penn State with a few. Um, we've got, um, I'd say, uh, a good five or six User teams represented here on these two teams, Coach. Yeah, I think you're right. We have a few. Uh, some of the teams, some teams might only had one, but hey, to have a player on there, it's that it's a great honor. So uh, you're happy either way, just to see your team represented there. Uh, I know personally to be able to get, uh, you know, it might just be the returner of the year and, and been the first team returner but it's still an honor to coach a player that that is got the skill to do something like that uh um just to be able to be a playmaker and to, you know to not only represent to, to represent his school with such pride to to say i came from fresno state and here i am a first team all-american and i know all of these teams all of these players all these coaches are proud of their players and and what they've done for their teams and and uh it's a great honor for all these young young men to be on these first and second team all american list yes absolutely uh we've got um just really quickly a couple of mentions here honorable mentions we've got some uh user freshman all americans and that's uh, just a couple here uh really quickly reggie roby at punter made freshman all american for syracuse gerald brooks from fresno state Strong safety, making freshman uh, All-American honors. Ronnie Hampton, at middle linebacker, not only made freshman All-American, but one of the All-American teams outright. And uh, there's Forrest Gregg and Jeff Bostick for Syracuse on the offensive line. Bostick and Gregg made freshman offensive line All-American without starting. The, remember the five Syracuse offensive linemen made first and second team All-Americans. So as the sixth and seventh offensive linemen, two freshman uh, offensive linemen for Syracuse making the, the, the freshman team uh, for the freshman All-American team. And that uh, that means that some of those some of those guys that are graduating on the line there that made those All-American spots are going to get quickly replaced. That's promising news for the offensive line program, something that, uh, that we've been trying to establish at Syracuse as one of our core strengths uh, starting to see those dividends pay off. Indiana, uh, we talked about this. You, uh, Coach, mentioned this when you talked about Indiana's uh, uh, star players. Corey Ostrander, a tight end, he makes the freshman All-American team for the Hoosiers thanks to his massive snap line this season. Uh, so we've got a few users that uh, had some, some promising talent uh, make some, some freshman All-American teams. Ronnie Hampton. Uh, and Brooks for Fresno State, along with uh, Ostrander for Indiana, and uh, those two offensive linemen and the punter for Syracuse. Yeah, you got to be, if you're a fan of these teams, you got to be excited to see these young men get to be on the freshman All-American team. Uh, you know, of course, all these guys would love to maybe one day be on the list, but hey, you're freshmen. Uh, a lot of the times, especially with you know, those, those two linemen on Syracuse, you know, you got four-year guys that have been here and they, they, they paid their dues and they're obviously a little bit better than you and you don't work from them because uh, that one day could be you. Uh, but it's still an honor for these young freshmen to be there, to be in an opportunity to make a difference for their teams. And, uh, you know, it's always a good sign to be on the freshman All-American team because it just means that you're already noticed. So you just need to go out there and keep playing the way you've been playing. I mean, somebody – out there looked and saw you as a freshman and thought this guy's got potential and he's played really good a lot better than all the other freshmen uh, in his position so uh, it's still a great honor for these young men to to be on this list and 
maybe give them a little bit added motivation to continue to play hard. Um, and because some of these guys, you know, are, are going to be some of these guys are going to be four year starters. Uh, like you yeah. said, I mentioned Indiana's tight end. He had a big stat line, and he's only a freshman. So who knows what he can do with the rest of three years? And Brooks on Fresno State, my my strong safety, he started as a freshman redshirt. So, you know, he could be a four-year starter. So a lot of these guys have tons and tons of potential, tons of room to grow. Uh, so we're excited to see what these guys can do in their future. Yeah, uh, and uh, I'm excited to, to say that we have seven out of ten uh, user coaches that are going bowling this year. Um, and uh, we've got seven user bowl games. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Coach, uh, these will be available on various streaming platforms, uh, many of which will be on Twitch, uh, some uh, within private lines within the league. If you're a league member, stay tuned to the message boards for information regarding those broadcasts. Uh, if you're involved in, in a bowl game, congratulations on getting a bowl bid. And if you are a follower of League One, Stay tuned on the league website uh, and, uh, and the Twitch channels. Uh, Coach will give you those, give you the information there uh, on the links for those uh, as we close out the broadcast. Uh, we have the web address for the league website as well as the various uh, Twitch channels where you can access all this information for this exciting upcoming bowl season that will end Le uh, League One's 16th season. A very exciting one. We've got an opportunity to have several teams finish ranked. We've got a few that are just inside the polls and a few that are just outside the polls. And if our users can pull off some big bowl wins, we could finish with several ranked uh, top 25 teams. Uh, but congratulations, big congratulations to the seven uh, users who qualified for bowls this year. Uh, you're going bowling. You're going to the postseason. Your seniors get to go out with a wonderful experience. And uh, it caps off a very successful season for each and every one of you. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous way to end the season. Congrats to all our coaches that are going bowling this year. Um, uh, yeah, it's all the hard work, all the time you've spent is paid off. You're here. Uh, it's, you know, now it's time to go take care of business uh, and and finish your season off on that high note. Uh, all the coaches there have made it are all capable of winning any game. We've seen them all win pretty big games. So uh, I expect um, that every single coach here can can go get W at the end of the season. So, uh, again, if you want to catch out, like I say, for our users, I mean, we have our message board. You can look at that. And, of course, you can always go to the website. Any uh, fans out there that want to know, if you go to our league website, and you see up there on your screen right now, I'm currently at our web website homepage, where you see it is just league1collegefootball.com. All you have to do is scroll down. Uh, eventually, I will have the schedule post there. You see the stories above, where you see Commerce Championship Week, Week 14 schedule. I'll click the Week 14 schedule just because it has more of our user games. Listed, you'll see something just like this. It'll say bowl schedule, and you will have below listed the matchups and where you can catch the game. Uh, where the Syracuse and Navy game, of course, will be on the link you see right there www.twitch.tv slash six gun ninja. That's where you can catch the Syracuse national title game against Air Force and the Navy game. The Little Caesars Pizza Bowl against the Ohio Bobcats. Yes. Uh, you can catch the Central Michigan. They also are live on Twitch. There is a link right there. Twitch TV. Twitch.tv slash Rich Creek 77. And of course, Fresno State. The live on Twitch.tv slash. Uh, well, actually, that link is not the right one anymore. It is slash. Silent Gaming 21. I will have that fixed on the website, but if you are currently watching this live, you are on the channel already. So if you are a fan and are new to the channel, you can go ahead and follow the channel and subscribe, and you should be able to get alerted of when the game goes live and be able to catch it. Um, I think that's about all we have in store for you. Uh, today, excellent uh, season 16, excellent performance uh, for the league. 
a very healthy season 16 and uh we've got seven users who still have one more game one more opportunity to go out on a high note and finish the season the right way and seven exciting bowl matchups will be coming your way this week if you're a coach strap on that chin strap pull out your coach's handbook your playbooks all your papers your your plays written down on napkins go back and look at the game footage uh, there's a lot of game footage available on some of these Twitch channels for our coaches as well as as well as our fans to access. But certainly if coaches uh, are playing a team that is in another user's conference who has broadcasted games, you may very well be able to access some important and key scouting information from those broadcasts on previous broadcasts if you go to those Twitch channels and maybe get some insight as to what kind of offenses and defenses these teams run what kind of expectations you might be able to have for the game game footage a very reliable source of information uh and a way to gain an edge on your opponent yeah cough, so cough, to cough, uh, hawaii acu uh, cough central michigan marshall cough fresno state usf all of those teams have had played this year against the user actually um, a common denominator all three of those teams I just coughed have played Navy. So. Yeah, go back and look at the footage uh, for, for Marshall Navy. Uh, go back and look at the footage for ECU Navy uh, and uh, and look at the footage for USF Navy. Uh, and uh, that, that goes for Fresno State, for Hawaii, and for Central Michigan. Um, and for for uh, for our other teams, uh, you know, uh, do everything that you can. Cross every T, dot every I. You'll regret it if you don't. Yeah, and you don't want to be that guy. I've been that guy. <laughs> Plenty of times. That's why I'm 7 and 5. But thank you guys again all for tuning in. Appreciate you guys watching. If you're a fan, I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, this is a lot of time, effort, and love put into this season. Or not to this season, into this league. Uh, you have a group of very, very passionate men that, that really enjoy this game and and just have a blast playing this. We have a good camaraderie here together, and um, we, you know we love doing this. It's it's uh, we love having fun with the game, but we love all the, the extra we do here. So if you are a fan watching, we really do appreciate it. It just gives us that little bit more of a you know give us a little bit more butterflies, give us a little bit more good feeling that you're here. And of course, to all our coaches that are watching, uh, you guys are awesome. You know it, it, it's a blast playing this with the, all of you guys. Um, and glad that we're about to, uh, or excited that we're about to wrap up our 16th season and cannot wait to see what's in store for the 17th season of League One football, college football. And you got your famous send off, Coach Spector. Yeah, um, we got a we got a lot of people that are starting college semesters right now. We got a lot of people that are heading back to work after the holidays, uh, getting back into the regular day to day grind. Uh, we hope we here at League One hope you guys all, no matter what you're up to this week, have an excellent week. Kick its ass. Thank you guys for stopping in. This is Coach Soundstorm and Coach Specter. Y'all have a good one.